I think you're muted. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you. So one question I want to ask is, you know, a lot of us, you know, everyone here is a student, you know, likely between the ages of like 18 and 22. So one question I have for you is when you were, you know, fresh out of high school or in high school, how, where did you see yourself being today and how did it sort of differ from your plan, if at all? Um, when I was getting out of high school, uh, I had just recently gone deeper into drumming in a very serious way, maybe like two or three years prior. Um, so I was planning on going to a music school and maybe at that time I didn't know where, but my goal was definitely to be a touring musician. Like I didn't need to be in the spotlight. I didn't have any interest in writing songs. Um, but I totally like at that point I was really getting into like John Mayer, John Mayer trio and, uh, Herbie Hancock and BB King. So like blues and R and B and jazz and funky stuff like parliament. And just like, I just wanted to tour as a sideman, And, um, so that was my, my, my motivation going into college. And I really wanted to like learn every style of music. Um, like I wanted to not take lessons from the great, the, the coolest drum teachers at school, but like the coolest bass teachers. Cause those guys are going to give you a drummer, totally different insight and uh, critiques than maybe another drummer would. Um, so yeah, I wanted to be a touring musician. Um, went to a lot of shows, obviously played a lot of shows and all this time I realized socially, I liked hosting. Um, I liked being around other people, but also kind of like, I wanted every, I wanted to put it all together. I wanted to be like, uh, I, I want, I always wanted to get lights for parties. Like if friends had house parties, I would be the guy that would be like, let me just bring some cool lights over and maybe like a weird fog machine. Um, cause that's like, you know, everyone knows once you get a cool, like tape light around your room, like that's game over. Um, so then I started kind of doing that and like, and DJing. Oh, I forgot in high school, early high school, like freshman year of high school, I went to, I got asked by someone to a dance and it was very scary, but I remember it was so awkward. Obviously it's awkward. It's always awkward, but there was a local radio station and they had some dude DJing and he was like middle-aged bald guy and he was just DJing music just playing top 40 hits and it had like the banner like the local Seattle radio station and it was just like okay that's it and I thought that was so weird because all of us felt awkward to dance in front of him or I did I felt awkward to dance in front of this guy and yeah. so I went home that night thinking like I wonder if I could like DJ or be like, wouldn't it be cool if like one of the students was DJing? So everyone's like more comfortable. It's kind of like a house party and you're just having fun. So I ended up doing that all through high school. I never went to a dance as a, whatever it's called. What Anyway, I was a DJ at all the dances and I would bring the lights and I would create the set lists and create the vibe. And then that kind of, that interest sort of went through college, past playing gigs and uh, this is a really long-winded answer. But anyway, I moved back to Minnesota. I move, I live right next to Keg and Case Market um, in St. Paul. And um, coming out of COVID, they started a music series outside on their big lawn. And uh, I reached out because I wanted my band to play there. And they returned by saying, hey, do you actually want to book Thursday nights? You have no budget, just book Thursday nights. And uh, I was like, yeah, sure. So I started booking and I would hire my friends and people I knew and I would actually pay out of my own pocket, which was very dumb. But I'd pay out of my own pocket to get like people that were pretty dope. And it started creating a thing. And then I started booking more days. And then I became the person that booked music at Keg and Case. And then I became the market director of Keg and Case. So I'm like taking rent checks from people in the market and like taking trash out. And so that was like my first kind of toe in the water of, of like uh service industry and the crazy stuff that goes on there. 
Um, and so to answer your question, uh, this was not part of my life plan when I was 18 years old. Um, it just kind of grew that way. I still want to tour and be a, a side man, a uh, musician. Um, but people have noticed that I uh, have done a good job booking music and can create a vibe. So I got referred to my business partner who is doing this uh, with me. And um, that kind of brings us here. Awesome. So then my next question for you is sort of, you know, coming out of COVID, you know, it's can be overstated, although it almost has been. It just had such like fundamental shift on um, all like parts of the music industry, but certainly live music. And I guess now, you know, a little over three years removed from that initial impact point. What do you see the state of live music being right now? you think it's thriving and wow what do you see moreover the like arc for like local music you know do you think bands are do you there are there any bands that come through the green room that you're like yes i see this band like blowing up in like five years what's kind of your mindset um i'm i try to be a generally positive dude because if you're not you're just gonna spend your life being sad and like finding things to be negative about um so obviously I mean, it's not quite what it was pre COVID the, the landscape of even just being a small business. Um, I don't know what that was like. I never ran a business like this before COVID, but I have heard from other people in the scene that people are just uh, not spending as much money. Obviously they're just a little more, eh, I'd rather stay in. Um, especially in Uptown. We're coming back, but it also wasn't what it once was. Like when I was in college, this was a different time, uh, space. Um, it's on the up though. Um, and that goes into the Minneapolis music scene. It's one of the coolest scenes in the world. And any musician, especially touring musicians, will say that. All these people that come in, they're like, there's just an energy, like right when you get in town, there's always something going on. Every musician wants to support every other musician. If you're not playing a gig, you're going to see a gig. Um, and everyone knows everyone. And it was tough to deal with certain clubs closing, like uh, Triple Rock Social Club, where and um a couple like a couple other bars that were really big in uh you know having hosting music um but a place like mine and there's there's a couple others that are opening up like down on lake street um and and pillar forum this coffee shop up in northeast that's like an all ages literal coffee shop they sell no liquor but they have great really hardcore music and um I'm raves about that place yeah it's great um that's awesome being in a small band being in two small bands that no one knows about like you need venues that are willing to just have music um and more are growing um does that answer your question yes absolutely right on. so if you don't mind, I'd like to turn it over to some student questions to see if, so if anyone has anything they want to ask Tanner, feel free to just unmute and yeah, say whatever you're, whatever's on your mind. Hi, um, my name is Alex. I have a question. So I know that you were explaining you have been in the music scene since high school, really, but for people who are maybe less experienced or less introduced to like the industry as a whole, especially coming out of college, um, do you have any tips for 
finding ways like into the industry you know what entry level like jobs internships to look for um just any information about how to kind of get a foot in the door uh biggest thing is just go to shows go to all the shows go to all the house parties see all the bands see them twice see them three times uh you're gonna start meeting people you're gonna start seeing familiar faces um probably on your second show you go to you will see someone you don't know you'll see him again and a conversation will start and something will blossom from that um everyone goes to shows i go to so many shows the owner of first avenue she goes to shows she goes to house parties um my good friend that uh that's one thing that i would do go to shows just talk to people um my good friend that graduated with me from college he got an internship at first avenue as a i don't know what the internship was maybe it was like a promoter rep which is basically like the representative of the venue um you meet the bands you check them in you pay you give them their check at the end of the night um and now he is like one of the main promoter reps full-time at first ave for all their rooms um first avenue is a great option because they are you know they're pretty big they got their stuff dialed they will be posting jobs all the time um and yeah it's really just like going out and talking you know you can you can do that you can apply to different music venues and things and maybe some bars are opening up and they're looking for someone who they don't really they can't really afford to pay much but they need someone who has an interest to book bands like every friday that could be an in too because that's kind of what i did at, at keg and case is i just started booking stuff for free and doing what i wanted and the neighborhood started coming out and people started hanging and they started buying more beer and like it turned out that the shows that i booked were busier than no shows so I was like, okay, let's keep you doing it. Um, unlike Seattle, unlike New York City, this city is so great for that, for networking. Everyone's relatively friendly. Um, and yeah, everyone's pretty active. That's, those are my suggestions. Thank you. Does anyone else have a question? So also some people submitted questions virtually, so I can read those out now. Cool. One person asked, what are the big challenges of, open, of, of operating a music venue? Making money. That is the big challenge of operating a music venue. Um, I didn't, I wanted this, when I opened it, it started as a, we're only going to be open when we have shows kind of place. Um, now it is, we are open Wednesday through Sunday. Our bar is open at four every day, Wednesday through Sunday. We close when we close, which is typically 10 or 11 or 12. And then we serve food. So now we're like a restaurant bar. And the reason we're doing that is because it is really hard to make money, make enough sales to pay rent, to pay labor, to pay all the other things. When the only time you're making sales is between 8 p.m. and midnight, which is when all shows are. Just a very small window. Um, obviously, if it's a sellout and everyone's just slamming the bar, that's positive. But it's really... It, not easy to get sellouts every night obviously that's the goal if it was easy you know we'd all be doing it um but working through that uh this 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 yeah figuring that out navigating that uh has been my biggest challenge i'm not a business major i'm a i'm just a drummer 
Um, but I have a lot of ideas and my whole family, they're entrepreneurs. They've started and closed uh, many businesses. And I'm very fortunate to get a lot of like advice and wisdom and mentorship from all of them. Um, but the biggest, yeah, one that I, this might sound so cheesy, but the biggest thing that is my like saving grace is just uh, being curious and being willing to try so many things and also being very, like I don't take myself or this place too seriously. Like I want it to be, I want it to be just like your living room, you know? Um, so what I think works for us, what I think will help us is how cozy it is and how personable this place is and how um, affordable it is. And again, how the musicians are treated and, and how good of an experience the audience has that will bring people back and hopefully, you know, equate in sales. And uh, I hate to talk about like, I care about money, you know, I, I want it to be a place of music and art and good times. But obviously, if we don't make money, like the lights don't stay on. Um, so that's my biggest challenge. Yeah, definitely. Um, I also like how you talked about how it's really, you know, the first thing is making sure people feel comfortable, especially making sure the artists feel comfortable. Just actually, I, there are like some venues in the Twin Cities that I love. And then there are some, there is one particular particular venue in the Twin Cities that my friend has a band, top five band on their Spotify wrapped list. And they're like, I do not want to go see this. I do not want to go see them live because the venue they're playing is the venue that I don't like. <laughs> you know, and it's unfortunately like, that's the reality. So I think it's you know it's really important, and I think I've been to the Dream Room a couple of times, and I think you really do like curate a good atmosphere there. So yeah, it's really important. I have another question here. Someone asked, no, of the bands that get sellouts and do really well at your venue, what do you think they're doing right? What do you think is like the, uh, what sort oh. of spark you see in bands that you see maybe in some bands that you don't see in others um that is a tough question because again if i knew if i really knew the answer to this like that i would be offering sellouts and having a great time and just rolling in it um but a common theme is is bands that are pretty creative on social media um, that, you know, obviously if you go viral, that's great. Uh, if you write a song and then show yourself doing a bunch of different stuff with that song on social media, Bear comes to mind. She's like a local artist getting pretty big right now. Uh, she will do like five TikToks or reels in the span of a week. And the audio will be the same song, but the visuals and the text and what she's doing will be so vastly different that it'll catch your eye every time. And you'll probably like learn something new, like you'll see a new lyric in a new way and it'll make you just fall in love with her and it'll make you want to go to her next show. Um, so she's kind of got that on lock. Another great uh, night here, a, a, just a great group was the Parachutes, um, the band Parachutes now, now shoots also with Aiden intro and those two are kind of like they're the same thing Aiden intro and shoots um they bring a crowd i don't know exactly how they got their crowd but they seem to be all college kids and i think it started with house shows and it seems like they just did the work like they, they're friends they love playing music they did the house shows you know two people came and then two people told their friends and then they did another house show and like it doesn't cost much to do a show um when you're at college and that just grew and it also helps to have an undeniably good product. So if your songs are just so damn catchy that you just can't stop singing it, that's good. Um, I don't know if those are all obvious, but like those are the common denominators with all my sellouts. Awesome. Does, I'm gonna open the floor once more. Does anyone have any questions? want to ask no pressure but of course this is an opportunity it's gonna be kind of kind of slay so maybe speak your heart's uh content
I have a question. Could you tell us a bit about the process behind, like, say, booking an artist? Yeah. Um, yes. Another insane learning experience for me. Um, I there's a there's a there's a dude that uh, his name is Ari Hirschstand, I believe. Um, he's from here. He lives in L.A. He's um, a pretty well-known like writer and speaker and just like source for music business and the current landscape of the music industry, how to be a successful independent artist and, you know, how to keep an independent venue open. He, he has so many books and podcasts about it. Uh, I went to one of his seminars, like just online seminar. And I asked the question, it was all about how do you book a successful indie tour as an indie artist? And I came to it as from the perspective of, okay, well, how do I, as a venue book those artists or how do I, compete as an independent venue in a world uh, surrounded by First Avenue and Live Nation. And the one thing he said was just be competitive. Like you got to come out with a competitive offer and um, treat your musicians well. Uh, so two things he said. Um, so I like to think I know how to treat musicians well. And then coming up with the offer part uh, was really just like shooting in the dark until I found something that worked. That's how it started. Uh, now I have a good feel of like what an artist, I don't want to say what an artist is worth, but what they'll accept. Um, being a musician. And again, I've played so many gigs where I've gotten paid $2 and I've gotten paid like 800 and it'll, it'll always change. But, um, that's really what it is. It's just being direct, being simple, reaching out to who you want, being quick, not too emotional. Don't need to do a whole story about why my venue is so great and why this show is going to change the world. Like, it doesn't matter. Just be quick, say what you want, say the dates that you're available. Um, everything's up for negotiation. Uh, get out, move on to the next one. Don't worry about it. Um, that's how I've booked a lot of bands right now that we're new. A lot of people are reaching out to me. So I'm kind of having to pick and choose um, bands that I think would do well in the space. I haven't, I have not done much of my own reaching out to others except for our grand opening, but um, soon I will be going into that more. Again, any more questions? I actually have a question. Are there, have there been any like shows you either like saw happen or just you know shows where you're like, how how did we get here? Like I was not expecting yeah. that type of thing to happen, you know, at the train room. Yeah, like I'm sure most of you know who Earth, Wind, and Fire is. Earth, Wind, and Fire played at Green Room. That's wild. And it and and I was just thinking about this before you asked that question. We've had a few of these where like um someone reaches out to me and they're like, "Hey, I know someone that can bring someone in. Can you open?" And it's always 24 hours notice or even like 12 hours notice. Tonight is one of those things. We are open. We are never open on a Monday. It is I do not want to be here at 8 p.m. on a Monday. But Janelle Monet is playing the Armory. Um, one, two, I don't know how many of you there are. Um, is that math 12? But um, you can't say this, but she's coming to Green Room after um, for an after party. And it happened. I was, I forgot where I was, but I got a text from a friend. He's like, yo, Janelle Monet and her DJ want to do an after party. Uh, we got to pay him $2,000. Uh, can you be open? And I, and only things I care about is like, do I have, staff that, that are willing do i have enough uh, liquor that people can buy um 
And yeah, those are the only things I need. Lights are already on. Do I have staff? Do I have enough liquor? And we had all those things and we sent the offer over to them. And they're like, great. You can't say Janelle Monet's name in public. You can only say her DJ's name. Uh, make sure you have security and let's do this. We made that happen in like the span of four hours. Same for Earth, Wind and Fire. Same for this uh, really great blues guitarist named Eric Gales. He played at the Coda and then the next night it was a travel day. So they just came here and they played a 20 minute set and then we had a house band play and it was just a big old hang. That is the best. Standing back there and not only are my dreams like coming true, but I can see all these like old and young people just so in it and just their dreams are happening. And, and, and that's that, those are the big moments for me when I see other people's like just lives almost being changed because of what's happening in this room. Uh, it's wild. Yeah. It's so weird. Cause I have like a lot of, like a lot of our bands that we have, you know, at the play at the whole music club student bands there's a huge overlap between us and you know y'all's venue and you know dial tone uh shoot oh yeah all that stuff and it's like re it's really interesting is that it's so like it's so interesting to me um where i'm like because i was at the uh what was it like the shine down like radio show a few months yeah. ago and I was like the same venue that like, you know, these like student bands, you know, that I love are playing shine, shine downs playing. I'm like, what's going on? This is like, there's something like weird, yeah. magical about this. And, thing. and I'm trying to figure out like why, I don't know if that happens many places. Like there's one music venue in North loop called bunkers, which is like a restaurant bar, just a dirty old club really. Um, and it's like so historic and cool because mainly because Prince used to walk in the back door uh, on Sunday and Monday nights. They have a residency. Every, every night they're open, they have a, a band that plays weekly, like a residency. And every Sunday and Monday, there's a band called Dr. Mambo's Combo. And they're just all, it's just like a cover band. And they just play Mo, Motown, Soul, R&B. And they're just so good. And they play songs that everyone knows. It's just like shooting fish in a barrel. It's just, you walk in and you're going to have a great time. Uh, the band, the musicians are so good. They're all like Prince alumni and Michael Jackson, you know, musicians and all this stuff. Um, that is the place. That's the one place in, in Minneapolis that like a huge band will come through. They'll play Target Center. They'll play whatever. And they'll want to, most of the musicians will want to be like, what's happening at Bunkers tonight? Uh, and they'll just go. And it's starting to kind of happen now with Green Room um, because like I said to an earlier question, like I have been playing around and just going to all these shows and trying to just be in the moment, like put myself in the right place at the right time. I'm like kind of forcing it a little bit. It's like, you know, if you know Stevie Wonder is going to be playing at the jazz club a mile away and you can't get tickets, just park your car outside the jazz club. Try to get a signature when they leave or like right when they come in. Like it might be a little pushy, but it's also, what have you got to lose? So these guys text me and they're like, hello. And they're like, uh, hey, can we do this last minute? And we're like, yeah, of course, let's make it happen. Um, yeah, and then the next night you get shoots to come in and it's a great show and it's just crazy. You know, for me specifically, it's like, I went to sleep with with Earth and a Fire, and I woke up, and now Shoots is here, and like, like that that stain on the ground, like the Earth, Wind, and Fire drummer poured his beer on the ground, and now Shoots is stepping on that stain. It's like that's so cool. I don't know. Yeah, definitely. So then, another question I have that I had um, submitted digitally was. What kind of goes into getting a team together for a music venue? Getting, you know, all the different, you know. I'm you still know. learning that. <laughs> uh, I am learning that the hard way. My business partner runs, sorry, you finish your question. Finish your question. Oh, no, that was it. It was, you know, from, you know, engineers, you know, uh, bartenders, stuff like that. Like, how does it all, like, come together? Yeah. So I, um, 
I mean, actually, truly, it's it's just what I want my, like, I have a few favorite bars, like dive bars near where I live, and also a few music venues that are my favorite. And I, I definitely spend a lot of time thinking about what makes these places so good. Um, nine times out of 10, it's the people. It's the employees. It's the bartenders uh, at the bars. That's what makes it. You have conversations. They're funny. Maybe they give you a free drink or whatever. It's just... That's what it is. Um, best music venues, as far as a musician, it's obviously the ones that you sound good. Obviously, if you sound good, you're going to feel good and your show's going to be great. You're going to look like you're having fun. And it's mainly because the audio tech is good at their job. Uh, and even more paramount of that, they are nice people. Musicians can be the worst people in the world. Divas, superstars, whatever they are, they can be so terrible to work with. And I almost feel bad saying this, but they can do that. Like some of the big ones, they've earned it, uh, you know, within reason. But I specifically hired audio techs, wanted audio techs to be audio engineers, to be um, patient, good, good, technically talented people, but m m mostly patient people that, can be able to set up a whole stage, take three hours to set up a whole damn stage and then have one person come in and be like, you know what? I don't want any of this. Can we do it this way? And be willing to change that whole thing over in 20 minutes and still pull out a kick-ass show without complaining. Just find a solution. I know it sucks. We'll talk to them later, but like, let's just get a solution because no one else needs to know about this. And the artist needs to be happy so that they can want to play here again and tell their friends. Uh, the bar, same thing. They got to be personable. They got to be just easy because you're going to get some shitty people. That will always happen, especially when alcohol is mixed. When you have alcohol and a shitty person, you just get, yeah. Um, and that was my motivation. On the other hand, I have a business partner that runs seven restaurants in town. So I was lucky and fortunate to have insight from him um, just to make that process simpler. And he kind of gave me a lot of really great nuggets about what not to do. Um, and after that, it's all been a big learning process. Huge. I People are so different. Everyone acts a different way. Everyone just is, everyone's just so different. And that's a beautiful thing, but it's also challenging when there's one manager that has to manage all the people. I can't use one way to manage people. I have to literally manage each person differently. Um, so that is kind of how you put a team together, I guess. <laughs> kind of like a band, really. If you're one person putting a band together, It's really like who you want to be with. Like you're, you got to be homies. Sometimes it could be like, oh, you're a great player. Like, let's just, let's do something. And then you end up hating each other, but you still create awesome music. That's very common too. Um, but yeah, that's my answer. Awesome. Do you, I have another question here. How did y'all, you know, find that space, the green room, and like what made, like, attracted y'all to that, like, real estate? Um. Okay. So, this is in Uptown. It's underneath a apartment building that was built like twelve years ago, maybe ten years ago. And the first, so the bottom floor on the street is all retail. It's all businesses, and then one floor up is all apartments. Um. This first retail spot was a fine dining restaurant called Coup d'Etat. It was like a French Creole themed thing, uh, which kind of is why they chose to put like um, sort of a mezzanine with like a railing at the similar height that you would find in New Orleans on Bourbon Street, you know, out on the balcony throwing beads down. It's all very reminiscent of that. Um, that was the first thing in this space. That business didn't work. It lasted maybe two years. Uh, but the owner of that business who was on the lease for that 10 year lease stayed on the lease. And so he found when they were deciding to close, 
he reached out to one of his friends that owned a club in downtown called Poor House. Hey, do you want to do a second location? It's in Uptown. It's right by Stella's. It's right by Uptown Tavern. It's right by Cowboy Jack's or Slim's. Uh, it's perfect. Come in. And they were like, yeah. So they spent some money. They changed the whole place up. They made it look like a nightclub. They put this stage in, mainly centered around DJs. Behind the curtain, behind the logo, there's like a DJ booth. Some of you probably might have gone here. I don't know. Um, but there's a big DJ booth that like looks down upon the people. It's very, um, it's great. Uh, and then, you know, they closed. They came into COVID, George Floyd. That was a tough time for this area. Um, they couldn't stick it out. So then they closed. But that one guy that had the restaurant was still the name on the lease. And he still has to pay rent. Um, so he's like, okay, let's try this again. What do we got? He comes in the space after five years, if not six or seven years. And he looks at it and he's like, okay, well, they, they, they took out my bar, which was in the center of the room. They put it over here. They added a thousand flat screen TVs. They put a lighting system in. They, they put this stage here sound system i guess it's a music venue maybe a club again he's a restaurant guy he's not a club dude he's not a music venue so he didn't he, he didn't really know he reached out to his one friend that's in the music scene that friend knows me that friend connected us and it was pretty, pretty much like hey tanner do you want to talk with this guy he might need some help opening up a music venue i was like yeah sure so that was like that was June of 2022. So over, over a year ago. And uh, that's kind of how I found this space. If that makes sense. It's all from the bones of poor house, but we don't need to talk about poor house anymore. Awesome. Well, I'd like to make one last call to see if anyone has any questions. Hi, so I was wondering, you kind of talked about how you took your experiences as a tour mus musician and that helped you um, with booking and other things like that. Is there anything that you've learned from your career right now that's kind of changed your perspective of being a musician? Like, oh, that's why they think that way or that's why this happens. Um. Yeah, that's uh, a great question. Uh, one thing that pops out is just the finances. Um, uh, I've kind of I kind of talked about this earlier. It's you know, it's hard to run a business, a small business. Um, it's interesting figuring out how much to pay bands. Uh, cause obviously as a musician, I want my friends and my fellow musicians to get paid as much as possible, but then I also want this place to stay open and keep offering gigs to as many people as possible. So that's been a big thing for me is like writing that line of what's fair, what's not fair. You know, I could always just take all the money and like keep green room open, but like every artist that plays might do a great show, but they're going to feel terrible after cause they're going to get paid a hundred bucks. Like that's not cool. Um, that's been the big learning experience for me. Uh, mainly. Um, there's been a, a few conversations that always end good, but some people have been like, man, why are you, why are you paying 70% of the door when, when, when you could just take the whole bar and pay the bands a hundred percent of the door. Um, I mean, there's reasons for that. When we first opened, everyone was making money except for us. And that was a thing my, my business partner said. He was like, dude, everyone's making money except for us. Like all the bands are making, dare I say, too much money. All these contractors, these audio techs, everyone's getting paid so much. And it was like, it's good that we can try that, but we're a small business. We got to start small and then grow. Um, that has my mentality changed when that started.
Again, any more questions? You know, I have a question for you, and I think we can start like closing things out here. Who would you say has been like the most like important part person, either in a partnership or as a mentor in your sort of journey in the music industry? Um. Well, right now, you know, there's so many people that love this place and support this place and want it to succeed i hear it every night i so appreciate it i definitely have imposter syndrome so i'm like okay guys well thanks whatever so so many i'm like so incredibly eternally grateful to so many people musicians too that that just want to be here but i have to say my business partner because he doesn't need to be doing this like he has spent money on me given me the keys to the damn castle. Uh, I came up with the name. It's now on the news. Like I did everything. He could have been so hands-on and so controlling of, of the look of the lights of the, of the, of the whole thing. And he chose not to. Um, and I mean, I love that. I don't like having a boss. So like he really gave me the, best space to do what I wanted to do um and he continues to be like really I see him kind of as like the uh the rails on a bowling alley when you when when you don't quite trust yourself to get the ball all the way down you know he's kind of just keep me in line especially with finances you know he can see trends and all this stuff um he rocks awesome do, do, do one last call to see if anyone else has any questions. Anyone wants to close us out here? That'd be amazing. Awesome. Well, that's all the questions I have for today. So I'd hope want everyone to thank Tanner for taking time out of his day to talk to us. Um, yeah, this has been really fun. I certainly learned a lot and I hope you all did too. And good luck with your event tonight, Tanner. Thank you so much. Uh, last thing I'll say is just, if you are thinking about doing something any night, and one of those ideas is going to see a show, go see the show. Even if it's like 20 minutes, just go see it. You don't have to spend any money. There's plenty of free shows. It will make the artist day to see one more person walk in. Um, it's super important and your night will be better if you do it. That's all. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks guys. Thank you. Cute. Awesome. Well, I think that went well. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Who's your, uh, who else do you got on the line coming? We got, okay, so we have the big show is going to be in October. We have Ricky Montgomery and Claire cool. Marie. So that's going to be fun. And we have a local you... artist uh, named Milo. Milo's opening up that show. Oh, fun. Yeah. Are you doing any more of these, like, just online things? Yeah, Um. so we have, geez, let's see what's up. Probably I a lot. Do, we do one of these every month, which is kind of oh, a bit intense. But let's see, next month we have, who do we, who do we have? A few big shows. Let's see. Unplugged. Music industry job series. To be on a Monday. Ooh. 
Lindsay Kimball. I'm going to be honest. I do not know who that is. I don't know who that is either. Yeah. Cool. Oh, program director for The Current. Awesome. Oh, fun. Yeah. It's a new fun one. And then I know we've been in talks to get like some like YouTube music reviewer like on, involved. And I don't know if that's going to work out, but I think that'd be very funny if we did that. So we'll see what happens. I don't know. There's a lot of like weird thing, weird spaces we can take in this series. I would, I would love to, if you can do it, I would love to hear from Sonia. Sonia Grover, I believe her name is. Uh, she is one of the talent buyers for First Avenue and she is just, such a lovely person. She's so easy to talk to. She wants you to succeed. She doesn't even know who you are. She just wants the best and has a lot to say. Uh, she doesn't gatekeep anything. She rocks. Um, if you can, if you can get her, I think she would like to do it. And I will RSVP to that. It'd be awesome. Awesome. I'll definitely keep that in mind. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. I hope you have a good night. Thanks. And, yeah. See you around. Yeah. See ya.